All right, uh, I will call this hearing of the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee to order. Today is March 2nd, 2023. We do have a quorum. Uh, first item on the agenda is the minutes. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 28th, 2023? I'll move the minutes, Madam Chair. All right. Representative Scott moves the minutes of February 28th. Any discussion to the minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are approved. Uh, first bill we're going to take up today is House File uh, 2000, uh, Representative Stevenson bill. Uh, I will move uh, to re-refer House File 2000 to the Public Safety Policy and Finance Committee. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Stevenson. Uh, please uh, tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. This bill legalizes sports betting in Minnesota, and we should be, gear from, be, be clear from the outset that sports betting is already happening in Minnesota. We have a robust black market here. People just use shady websites, digital workarounds, and other means to place bets. What this bill is about is creating a legal marketplace that will displace that illicit market, and in doing so, provide consumer protection, ensure the integrity of the game, and limit money laundering and other illegal activity. In 2018, the Supreme Court struck down long-standing federal law prohibiting sports betting in states other than Nevada and New Jersey. And since then, over 30 states have legalized sports betting. All of Minnesota's neighbor states, as well as Canada, have legal sports betting. This is an idea whose time has come, or in the words of my friend Pat Garofalo, no Minnesotan should have to go to Iowa to have fun. <laughs> Having said that, it is important to get this right. This is the biggest change to our state's gambling laws in 40 years. And during the interim, I engaged with every stakeholder I could. This was an interim a year ago. I traveled the state going all the way from Red Lake in northern western Minnesota to sports betting data companies located in downtown Minneapolis, listening and trying to develop a Minnesota-specific model for legal sports betting. During that process, I consulted with all 11 of the tribal nations located uh, in Minnesota, along with our professional sports teams, the University of Minnesota, sports betting companies, and experts on problem gaming. I also examined the law in other states uh, that have legal sports betting. Uh, the product of all of that work is a bill that's before you today. It is substantially similar to the bill that passed with bipartisan support off the House floor last year. Uh, the bill includes both brick and mortar sports betting uh, at tribal casinos, as well as statewide mobile sports betting operated by the tribes in partnership with commercial operators. To put that in plain terms, if this bill passes, Minnesotans will be able to visit sports betting lounges at casinos all across Minnesota, and they'll also be able to wager on sports on their smartphones anywhere in the state. We would tax mobile sports betting at levels consistent or below states around the country. This money generated from the tax would be dedicated to three causes. First, the regulations and consumer protections necessary to make sure that sports betting is fair and doesn't influence what's happening on the field, particularly at the amateur level. Second, we devote 40% of the tax revenue generated to addressing problem gaming. Uh, and we need to be honest. Most people can gamble without issue, but for a small subset, it's a real problem. We would devote more resources than ever before to confronting this problem. This would be the largest investment by far in any state in the country on problem gaming ever. <laughs> Finally, 40% of the tax revenue raised would go to funding youth sports and other youth programming across the state, but with particular emphasis on communities experiencing high levels of juvenile crime. <coughs> juvenile crime is at unacceptable levels in Minnesota, and while there's no single cause or one single solution, we know that when kids are busy playing sports, they're not getting into trouble doing something else. House File 2000 is supported by the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association and its member tribes. It's also supported by all of Minnesota's professional sports teams. And we continue to talk to all stakeholders in efforts to improve the bill. And with that, Madam Chair, I know there might be some testimony. All right, thank you. Uh, did you check with our professional ultimate team? Our professional ultimate team. Well, add that to the list. Yes, the Minnesota wind chill on notice. Um, we do have a couple of people from the public uh, signed up to testify. Uh, I have David Prestwood. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Could you explain what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what there's a, there's, a, there's a game with the frisbee. You so you cannot call it frisbee. They will oh, come for you. Oh, oh. Um, but ultimate is is a, you essentially play on a football field and you throw an object that looks like a frisbee to those of us who grew up calling it a frisbee, a disc. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's right, it's really you. fun to watch. Shout out to the windchill. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry about that, Mr. Prestwood. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Thank you. As someone who played a lot of Ultimate in college, I appreciate the call out. Uh, my name is David Pressford. I'm Government Affairs Manager for DraftKings. I'm here to provide testimony today in support of House File 2000 relating to sports wagering. We really appreciate the uh, opportunity to participate in these conversations and discuss the importance of embracing a competitive and fully functional mobile sports wagering market. DraftKings is a digital sports and entertainment company created to fuel the competitive spirit of sports fans with products that range across daily fantasy, regulated gaming, and digital media. We were founded in 2012 in Boston, Massachusetts, and we are live with mobile and or retail sports betting in 22 states. We support a sports wagering framework in Minnesota that protects consumers, generates revenue for the state, and stamps out the pervasive illegal market. Sports wagering is not new to Minnesota. An estimated 1.17 million people in the state are making a combined total of more than $2.5 billion in illegal wagers annually. Nearly all of these wagers are placed online in the robust illegal market, where sophisticated illegal operators capitalize on the popularity of this form of entertainment. Fortunately, across the country, states are bringing this activity into legal regulated markets that mandate robust consumer protections. To date, 36 states have legalized sports betting in some form, including 21 that have authorized mobile sports betting. As Minnesota continues to debate converting the illegal sports betting market, we encourage you to do so in a manner that provides the robust and smart consumer protections endorsed by the National Council on Problem Gambling. Um, we believe the provisions of this bill within the jurisdiction of the committee are well drafted. There's a data sharing provision we're continuing to work on with various stakeholders, but we encourage you to advance this bill this morning. We look forward to working together to ensure the bill will bring betters into a legal, regulated, and taxed market. And thank you for your time. Right, thank you for your testimony. Uh, the other person I have signed up ahead of time is Susan Sheridan Tucker. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Susan Sheridan Tucker, the Executive Director of the Minnesota Alliance on Problem Gambling. For 21 years, we've been the state affiliate to the National Council on Problem Gambling. The Alliance is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of those affected by problem gambling through advocacy, education, training, and research. We hold a neutral position on legalizing gambling. So that means we're not supporting or opposing the expansion of sports betting in Minnesota. But we really do furiously advocate that any measure affecting the accessibility of gambling provide for those adversely affected by this, uh, by this activity. This means funding for training, treatment, awareness, education, research must be part of the bill, which it is. It also means that we expect all stakeholders involved in gambling, include operating, including operators and regulators, to adopt and implement best practices in reducing harm to all its customers, particularly those who are exhibiting problematic gambling behavior. It's fitting that I'm here this morning in March, which is Problem Gambling Awareness Month, and all over the country, organizations like ours are making efforts throughout this month to get the word out that problem gambling is an addiction, it's a public health issue, and it can be effectively treated. We recognize that most Minnesotans can gamble without a problem, but let's not forget the 250,000 Minnesota adults who exhibit problems with their gambling and the 56,000 who likely meet the clinical criteria for gambling disorder, nor the 10,000 high school students who indicate signs of problem gambling. You should also know that for every one gambler, there are seven to 10 others who suffer harm because of their loved one's gambling. There are many things I would like to share with you today, but due to time constraints, I'm gonna limit my comments to uh, information sharing. I'd like you to take into consideration additional language to subsection 19, uh, subdivision three. Uh, to enable, I, I'd like us to consider language to enable a state university or a gambling neutral organization focused on prevention and responsible gambling to request access to aggregated data for purposes of conducting research to assist the commission in, in ensuring the integrity of the game or to improve state funded services related to responsible gambling and gambling addiction. The data would not be public and the state university or gambling neutral organization would not disclose the data to any person except for the purposes of conducting approved research or as part of a peer reviewed research report or pursuant to an agreement 
between the state university or the gambling neutral organization and the sports gaming proprietor. These provisions would mirror the states of Ohio and Massachusetts, two states that have enacted strong consumer protections pertaining to gambling. In so many ways, mobile betting presents challenges to, to those most vulnerable to addiction. It's a gateway to data collection, which has not been seen uh, for, uh, in normal uh, gambling uh, platforms. Operators and their licensees will be co collecting quite a bit of data that can help answer many questions that researchers have concerning gambling behaviors and can provide insights into whether more individuals are becoming addicted to gambling. Without access to anonymized player data, we are denied the ability to discern the real impacts. As technology becomes more sophisticated, algorithms are designed to tailor to individual players almost in real time. Learning what games a player likes to play, what kind of bets they make, how much they spend, how much the time they've played, how much they've lost, how much credit has been extended to them. Ms. These are Ms. all Tucker, I'll need you to wrap up. data. Um, and so we'd like you to consider that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any other members of the public wishing to testify on this bill? Please come down. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Um, Madam Chair and members, my name is Leah Patton. I'm Executive Director of the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition. Our coalition ma is made up of four sponsoring organizations, the Islamic Center of Minnesota, the Jewish Community Relations Council, the Minnesota Catholic Conference, and the Minnesota Council of Churches. Um, I'm here to testify in opposition to House File 2000. Um, we're concerned um, that this would create much more access, essentially bringing gambling into every home, every school, every workplace in our state with 24-hour access. Um, this will exacerbate existing problem gamblers. People with addictions will have a harder time um, and their families will be negatively impacted. Um, we're also concerned that this particular form of gambling is really appealing to younger people. Um, a study from the University of Minnesota uh, found that college students are two to three times more likely to develop um, compulsive gambling behaviors. Um, and again, with 24 hour access, we're concerned that this will exacerbate that problem. But I do want to acknowledge how intentional Chair Stevenson has been in addressing our concerns over the last couple of sessions that we've uh, worked with him on this bill. Um, we're really pleased that it includes a 21 plus provision, um, restrictions on targeting advertising towards younger people, and that it allocates a lot of resources towards um, gambling addiction as Chair Stevenson mentioned. So um, it's essentially a pretty good version of something we just don't like. So. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for summarizing that really well. Um, is there anyone else from the public wishing to testify on this bill? That might be the best um, opposing testimony I've ever heard on a bill. Good I'll job. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, moving on to member discussion. <laughs> oh, will represent Carol. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me just say to, uh, to uh, Chair Stevenson, that I appreciate your efforts, but have, having grown up in Iowa, I can attest to the fact that you can have fun in <laughs> Iowa, especially various parts of Iowa. Uh, secondly, it seems like, um, as a Hennepin County prosecutor, looking at the various legislation that you're authoring and, and working on, that your common denominator is you want to eliminate the black market whether it's here or cannabis or whatever. Uh, Representative Carroll, we can't speak to motives. <laughs> <laughs> it goes both ways. <clears throat> well, it's a good motive. I, it doesn't matter. All we right. can't speak to why people do things. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate the, the admonition. But anyway, I applaud uh, Chair Stevenson's efforts. And uh, I, I've talked to him about this bill. I was concerned about the uh, addiction aspects and the, the steps he's taken to um, to deal with that. And importantly, to, to try to eradicate the black market. So thank you. Right, uh, Representative Scott, or do you wanna go last? I can go now. Okay, so Representative matter. Scott. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't disagree with the last testifier's um, <laughs> uh, sentiments, but, um, 
not a big fan of gambling. I've seen it harm a lot of people. But um, Representative Stevenson, um, you came up to me, and I guess you tried to call me. I'm sorry, I didn't. It was my phone was buried in my purse, but. Um, uh, last year when the bill was heard, we talked a little bit about um, the data pieces and there's a list um, that um, people that have problem gambling or other issues that they would go on this list um, as being prohibited to participate. And uh, just the, the comments made back then were saying, how does a person know they're on that list? How do they get their name off of that list, if ever? Um, and it, so my comments, I guess, would be surrounding that particular list. And gee, I, you know, I'm looking through all the data that these companies are gathering. I'm like, that's enough for me to keep me away <laughs> from ever doing participating. But it just seems like there's an awful lot of information that's being gathered. And I, if you could speak to that, if that's normal and what other states have done, um, and I'm happy to work with you on the other stuff. Representative Stevenson. Madam Chair, Representative Scott. Yeah, and I, as we talked briefly before the hearing, I'll just say it publicly that we'll, I'm happy to work with you on the issue that you raised last year on the floor, and um, I'm sure we can find a resolution for the issue of how do people know when they're on the list and how that, that, that specific list data is, is treated. As to the broader question of how much data is collected uh, from sports betting is obviously a data intensive enterprise to do mobile sports betting, just the nature of the beast, right? Uh, you're uh, wagering money at different times on different games and from that you can ascertain a lot about um, a person. The bill is very consistent with what um, uh, other states have done uh, in uh, this regard, other states that have legalized mobile uh, sports betting. That's not to say that we couldn't do better, and so I'm always open to suggestions uh, on uh, these issues. And I think we heard one today that I'm intrigued with, which is uh, allowing the university to have access to disaggregated data um, uh, to do uh, the pur for the purposes of studying. Uh, uh, Ms. Sheridan Tucker uh, testified to that. And I wrote a note down to look into that, uh, that thing. So, yeah. Uh, Representative Scott, all right. Uh, Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn. Uh, and Representative Stevenson, I just have a question, um, presumably a quick one, um, but I had a couple meetings about this bill and I've gotten a couple different answers, so I just want to get on the record. Um, does this bill allow people to vote on politics or other non sports mm. um, events? I've tried to look through the bill and look for like the definitions, but depending on what one considers a sport, right? <laughs> I, think it would be, I think it would be good to recognize whether or not we can bet on the presidential election, for example. Representative Stevenson. What a good question. And um, I don't think so. I don't believe that you would be able, Madam Chair, Representative Finke, I don't believe that you would be able to wager on uh, political activity as a result of this bill, that's certainly not the intent of the bill. Uh, the bill allows wagering on athletic events and my reading of that definition wouldn't include that. Um, but maybe we could clarify that. All right, Representative Figge. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. And um, this isn't, I'm not trying to gotcha you, I'm just trying to figure that out because I think yeah. it's a question. There's later on, there's a definition of sports betting uh, in that one. So there's like athletic and then there's sports betting and it just seems like something worth knowing. Seems like maybe an easy clarifying piece that we could do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Representative Weens. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Stevenson. Um, Mr. Presswick uh, mentioned, I think, a figure of 2.8 billion uh, as far as the market. So I was curious if that is the market for potential market for Minnesota, and then what the uh, tax proceeds might be for sports betting or blood sports betting, depending on what. Uh, uh, Representative Finke was, was getting to on the political side. Uh, but if you could just give me a figure, just what, what you think that scope is and what the proceeds collected by the state would be. Representative Stevenson. And Madam Chair, I'm gonna answer that question, but first I wanna go back to Representative Finke just for a second to say that I looked at the wrong definition. When I said athletic event, later on in the bill, as Representative Finke points out, it's sports betting is tied to the definition of sporting event, which is subdivision 18 in the definitions, which I think is a little bit more clearly excluding uh, political activity. So I think the bill does that. We could also do a clarification later. 
Okay, so back to this question. There was a revenue estimate last year uh, that uh, if you do the sort of backdoor math, it came out at about a, a 1.2 uh, billion in the mature uh, market for the uh, total size of, of the market here. I think that many people, you heard at one testifier today, think that that's a conservative um, estimate. Uh, important to note that sports betting is a high volume, low margin business and we're ta taxing on the margin. This is a net revenues uh, tax of, of 10% which is deliberately designed to be low because um, uh, we are trying to get rid of the illicit marketplace and we don't want to drive people out of it by having higher costs. The revenue estimate uh, from last year indicated $12 million uh, a year at maturity. Okay. Madam Chair, Representative Weins. Yep. yep, and we've got three other bills to get to today. So we've got a couple other my, people on the my list. last so. question. Yep, Madam Representative Weins. Uh, Representative Stevenson, so I see that there's not a requirement for enforcement. Do you intend or do you think that there's going to be uh, an added cost to, to Attorney General or to whoever uh, on the enforcement side of things? Representative Stevenson. Madam Chair, Representative Weins, the bill is designed to be self-supporting. So the tax for the regulation and the enforcement from AGED and other entities are not the Attorney General's office, the Alcohol Gambling Enforcement Division in the Department of Public Safety are accounted for in the bill. So we want the tax revenue to pay for the enforcement costs. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Johnson. <coughs> uh, Chair Becker, Becker Finn, uh, Representative Stevenson. I was intrigued when they talked about that aggregated data getting to do some studies, <clears throat> which I think is very important because I, I actually know a few people that are addicted to gambling uh, when the casinos opened they would spend a lot of time there they wiped out their entire family's uh, funds they would sit there for 30 24 36 hours they'd be wearing a diaper so they could keep playing um, it's a serious issue and I think we need to as we go forward with this be very careful because the addiction on gambling and addiction at all is a serious issue that we need to deal with Thank you. Uh, all right, closing comments, Representative Stevenson. Appreciate the really uh, great discussion today and, and the couple avenues we have to additional work. I will uh, do that in the committee stops to come. I ask for a guest vote today. All right, uh, let's see. We'll renew my motion that House File 2000 be referred to the Public Safety Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion prevails. Uh, the bill is on its way. Representative Stevenson, you don't get to leave yet. Um, and I will move. Uh, now we've got 1370 members. The uh, the amendment that was handed out at the beginning um, by the pages that didn't make it into the packets, that's for this bill. Uh, so House File 1370, I will move to re-refer House File 1370 to Public Safety Policy and Finance. Um, I see we've got an A3 amendment. Uh, that's what was handed out. Uh, Representative Stevenson, would you like us to do that amendment first? That would be great, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, can you tell us briefly what the A3 does? Yes. So this bill was heard in the Elections uh, Committee, and there were some suggestions uh, from uh, minority members, uh, and so it incorporates those uh, changes. All also right. Also makes a technical fix. All right. Any discussion to the A3? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Stevenson, please tell us about your bill as amended. All right. Madam Chair and members of the House Judiciary Committee, I'm here today to urge that the legislature address the issue of deepfakes, in particular those that depict sexual content or are used to influence the outcome of an election. Deepfakes are synthetic media that use advanced artificial intelligence techniques to manipulate video or audio content. These technologies make it possible to create highly realistic yet completely false depictions of people doing and saying things that never actually happened. This has serious implications for privacy, free speech, and the integrity of our elections. One of the most concerning applications of deepfakes is the creation of non-consensual pornographic content, which is commonly referred to as revenge porn. This is a serious violation of privacy and can cause significant harm to the individuals portrayed in the content. In many cases, the victim is unaware that the content exists and may only discover it after it has been widely shared online. Another area of concern is the use of deepfakes in political propaganda and election interference. With the increasing sophistication of these technologies, it's becoming easier to create convincing fake news or propaganda that is designed to manipulate public opinion. This could potentially have a significant impact on the outcome of elections, undermining the integrity of our democratic process. To address these challenges, I believe it's necessary for legislation to be enacted that regulate the distribu distribution of deepfakes. This issue is a serious and growing concern that demands immediate action. I urge this committee to take the steps 
to protect the privacy, free speech, and democratic rights of all citizens. Thank you. Madam Chair, those comments that I just uh, read to you uh, were written by the Artificial Intelligence Service chat GPT in their entirety uh, as a result of a one-sentence prompt uh, asking them for a comments to a legislative committee in support of deepfake uh, legislation. So that's how advanced artificial intelligence is. Everything I just said to you uh, was written as a result of a one-sentence uh, prompt. Well played, uh, Representative Stevenson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this bill, uh, just as one last thing I'll say is we did hear this bill in elections. It uh, had unanimous support there. And, and as I mentioned, we incorporated the, some feedback from members of the minority in that uh, committee into the amendment you just adopted. All right. Um, I've got one uh, person signed up to testify, uh, Elena Niehoff. Okay. Don't, don't need to testify. All right. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to testify on this bill? Right. Seeing none, we will move on to member discussion. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Stevenson. Um, I'm, uh, I, I want to ask a couple questions about the exceptions on, um, on page uh, three um, in the private cause of action. And, and the, I think the exceptions track in both the private cause of action and in the, um, and in the election provision. But, um, and I understand, I think the reasoning for a, a, a number of these um, I, I was confused a little bit, or w wanted to hear a little bit more of the reasoning for the for exceptions five and six. Number five is uh, that the deep fake relates to a matter of public interest and dissemination serves a lawful public purpose. And six is that the dissemination is for legitimate scientific research or educational purposes. Um, I, I guess my, my question is really whether your bill is going far enough. Uh, so help me to understand what those exceptions uh, would allow and what the purpose of those is. Representative Stevenson. Madam Chair, Representative Niska, so I'll start with the process by which we drafted this bill, and that might be pretty illuminating as to why there are exceptions in the bill, which are that uh, we modeled this legislation off of legislation that's been enacted in Texas and California in conjunction with Minnesota's own revenge porn law, which has been upheld now after being significantly revised uh, by our, our state courts. So we wanted to adopt uh, a narrow approach in order to uh, try and make sure that we would withstand uh, judicial uh, scrutiny. So these exceptions are exceptions that have been uh, part of statutes that have been previously upheld uh, on, on these uh, subjects. Um, if there's a, a specific problem with those two exceptions, I'm very open uh, to hearing them and how they relate to um, and if we think that we can eliminate them without uh, damaging the, the constitutionality of the overall measure. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Stevenson. I, 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 I'm honestly asking for like some clarity on or some understanding about what the what those actually mean and what they what they would allow that. Uh, so if you have any ideas about what those um, mean, that would be helpful. Or if there's a court case I can go look at that would help me understand that. That's. Um, Repres really what I'm looking Representative for. Stevenson, he loves looking up court cases. Yeah, so. uh, Madam Chair, <laughs> uh, Representative Niska, uh, perhaps Mr. Johnson can help me here and remind me the, the, the I think it's Casillas, is that, what's the revenge porn case? Do you recall? Yeah. We'll find it for you, Representative Niska. Yeah. We, we can get that information to you. I, I, I bet we could even look up the case on Westlaw and send it to everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, any further questions, Representative uh, Niska? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is, uh, thank you, Representative Stevenson, for uh, look, uh, taking on this issue. I think it's important. Uh, Representative Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you for working on this bill. Um, I like it a lot. I did have a question about the amendment, just uh, one of the, the line 1.8 um, that says, uh, injunctive relief may be maintained against any person who is reasonably believed to be about to violate. And I'm just curious where that language comes from and um, if you could just maybe describe that, that would be helpful. Representative Stevenson. Madam Chair, Representative Moeller, so uh, as I, I meant in the elections committee, there was some desire to see injunctive relief added to the elections uh, side of the bill. I believe there's already in, injunctive relief on the uh, porn pornography side even before uh, the bill uh, started. Um, your question is specific to the language about um, about how that section is drafted, and I don't know if uh, Mr. Johnson can articulate uh, how how that's probably consistent with other injunctive relief um, sections. Uh, Mr. Johnson, and you keep him busy, Representative Stevenson. I'm very unfair to Mr. Johnson, but he never never fails me. <laughs> 
Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Stevenson, Representative Moeller, um, I'm going to have to to say that I need to remind myself where this language specifically came from. Honestly, I don't remember if it was sent to me as a specific request or if I pulled it from existing statute when drafting this, but I can get back to you later today. It's headed to uh, the Public Safety Committee after this, so um, I think we'll, we'll be able to address it uh, at that point if that's okay, Representative Muller. That's fine, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, any further, uh, Representative Scott? Just real quickly, um, Representative Stevenson, on the the questions that Representative Niska had. Um, I know this is going to public safety, so I'm, I'm just looking for examples of five and six and uh, those exemptions of like what what it means and what kind of everyday examples um, that we could kind of relate to. Um, like what's a matter of public interest? I, I And I don't know if Mr. Johnson has an answer to that, or if you do, or maybe that could be asked in public safety, but I'm really curious about some of those exceptions and what they actually mean practically. Representative Stevenson. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, I think I'm, I'm through abusing Mr. Johnson for today, uh, but I will, uh, <laughs> I can that's probably one. not even true. Oh, he I'll says he can handle this one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he can handle everything, he but uh, everything. Mr. Johnson. Um, Madam Chair, representatives, so this language is identical to the language that's in current statute that's related to what the two provisions that are currently referred to as our revenge porn bill, 617, I think it's 261 is one of them, and I forget the other citation, but it's in both places right now. My understanding is that both of those were adopted in relation to that bill uh, with the idea that sometimes having been turned into an anonymous situation, faces blurred out, et cetera, it can be helpful to share some of that information, essentially to fix a problem, to show that the initial, that, that the falsified image was somehow falsified and show it in a comparison. I believe that's the purpose of the uh, being a matter of public interest and sh therefore serving a lawful purpose. So for example, a news report might say, here's the fake one, here's the real one, here's how you know that it's fake. And in that situation, disseminating the artificial would be protected and not a violation. Great answer, Representative Scott. Yeah, thank you, that was very helpful. And that was, uh, as I read through this bill, I'm like, well, how do you know what's real and what's not? You know, what has been made up? Is there, are there specific things that they look for, if you know the answer to that question, Representative Stevenson? Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, I'm, I'm not that technologically sophisticated as my children uh, can Remind attest to. And, um, <clears throat> and I will note, I, I, this isn't quite to what you're saying, but you know there are specific intent and knowledge requirements in order to be liable. So you would have to know that something is not real in order to be liable under the bill, which isn't, I, I think you're more asking just as the average person, how do, you, yeah. how do you spot a deep fake? And I think part of the problem is it's getting increasingly hard to do just that, right? And that's why this is necessary. Like if it was really obvious that something was fake, we wouldn't need a, a law necessarily uh, on this. But now it's getting to the point where it's, really difficult for the average person uh, to be able to tell. And the application of deep fakes is getting increasingly sophisticated and increasingly dangerous. So for instance, there were deep fakes created of Ukrainian President Zelensky telling uh, soldiers to retreat uh, and to give up uh, that were distributed uh, in, during the, the war in Ukraine by um, you know, Russian uh, advocates there. So <clears throat> it, it's getting pretty scary out there. And I think that's the time when we need to step in and set, set some uh, boundaries. Yeah. All right, Representative Scott, anything further? Uh, just it's it's so creepy, and <laughs> and I feel like I'm living out a Saturday morning cartoon where some diabolical scientist came and could do all this. It's just unbelievable that we're here. But thank you for allowing me the question. Yeah, and uh, Representative Stevenson, I know um, you had been in you know knowing that this was going to come through our committee. I know that you've been diligent in working on this for a while now. So I I think this is a good bill and glad we can move it forward. Uh, closing comments, Representative Stevenson. It's a good bill, thanks for the good discussion and uh, thanks for giving me more of your committee time, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, uh, I will renew my motion to re-refer House File 1370 as amended to the Public Safety Finance and Policy <laughs> Committee. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. Representative Keeler.
All right, so members, this is the uh, the ICWA MIFPA bill that, if you remember, this is the bill that we heard the joint testimony um, over in the Capitol with uh, children and families, and now we actually have the bill in our possession, um, did go through discussion and uh, the process in children and families, and now it's with us. Um, in the meantime, the bill did pass, this is the first time this has actually happened since I've been chair of this committee, um, that the bill passed in the Senate, um, and so we did replace that with the Senate file number, so we're working off of the Senate file, so that's why there's a Senate file in your packet and not a House file, because this already uh, passed uh, over in the Senate. Uh, so with that, um, I will move to get uh, Senate file 667 in front of us, um, and then I'll move to recommend that Senate file 667 be placed on the General Register, and then again, since we already took testimony, um, today's just a discussion and then voting on the bill. Um, I know we have a couple folks in the audience available for questions questions as well as uh, Representative Keeler. I see we've got Chairman Fairbanks uh, here as well. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, Representative Keeler, uh, any opening comments before we get into discussion? Um, thank you, Chair Beckerfin and members. Um, really, we had the conversation, we had the discussion. Um, we do have tribal leaders here and I would actually like to just yield my time for our tribal leader to make a statement. Sure. Uh, Chair, Chairman Fairmakes, please uh, introduce yourself for the record. Welcome to our committee, and uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and also members of this committee. I'd like to say miigwech from White Earth Nation. You know, I know this, this bill has been, been a good bill. You know, I know protecting our children, and, you know, I think it's, it's beneficial to all the nations across Minnesota. I know it's in, how important it is that that we, we get your support, you know, on this. And I, I think it's just, it, it, it's a, good, it's a good, good thing for all of us. So I want to say a big to all of you in this committee for, for being a part of this. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, and thank you very much for being here. It's not every day we have um, tribal chairman here in the committee, so I appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, with that, we will move on to member discussion. Uh, members, any discussion to the bill? And we kind of fully talked about it, uh, heard a lot of testimony previously. Uh, Representative Curran. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I just want to, I know uh, Representative Keeler, uh, Representative Koslowski, we've talked about this before. Um, I just really appreciate all your effort on, on, on this bill, uh, making sure that it's moving forward. Um, it is, you know, one of the most important things that I think we're gonna pass this session. And so I just wanna make sure that that's heard today um, and that you're appreciated again. Um, I know how tough it is to go through this information time and time again. Um, and so I just wanna acknowledge that and thank you for your diligent work on this. Thank you. All right, any further discussion to the bill? Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanna say this is a good bill, it's the right thing to do and I encourage members support. Uh, any closing comments, Representative Keeler? Madam Chair, I would just um, acknowledge that there was a fiscal note that came over from the Senate confirming that there's no cost to this. I know that that's been some of the questions and I'm not sure when we take a Senate file if you see the Senate fiscal, but there is no cost to it. That was one of the questions. Yeah, thank you for getting that on the record. All right, uh, with that, I will renew my motion to recommend that House uh, Senate file uh, 667 be placed on the general register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion prevails. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chairman Fairbanks uh, and the other uh, tribal leaders who are here today. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Representatives and Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you. All right. Representative Greenman. I know. Not like her <laughs> no, it isn't like her. <laughs> Probably got another committee to be in. All right, so uh, I guess it's, it's, I'm not gonna recess us, but if you, this would be the time if you wanna go to the bathroom, um, <laughs> grab a refill on your coffee. Um, we'll give her a couple minutes to get here. There, there we go, Representative Greenman. Oh. 
<laughs> just, just about the hound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We were just you wait for your phone to blow up with everyone asking where you are. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, I will move to re-refer House File Three to the State and Local Government Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, I know that we have the A15 amendment. Uh, Representative Greenman, would you like us to move that amendment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your patience and letting me come a minute late. Um, and uh, yes, I'd like you to move that amendment. All right, I will move the A15 amendment. Representative Greenman, please tell us what the A15 does. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The A15 does three things. Um, first, it includes a set of technical changes and conforming changes to align with the bill's um, language in the Senate that, that, that's sort of a little bit ahead of us in the um, uh, committee process. Um, the second thing it does is it reflects input from MMB on the AVR portion of this bill applicable to agencies other than the DMV and DHS and requires them to submit a report to the legislature by October uh, 2025 detailing how the agencies, um, which agencies can implement automatic voter registration and what they would need to do it. Um, and then the third thing it does is it clarifies uh, that the intent, um, which was written with this bill um, in a civil action, is for a reasonable person standard to apply to each component of the voter intimidation provisions. All right, any discussion to the, uh, let's see, a15 amendment. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Representative Greenman, uh, please tell us about your bill. And as we discussed, uh, the reason the bill is here because of the uh, civil penalties as well uh, as the data provision. So if we can stick to that, that would be really helpful. Uh, please go ahead, Representative Greenman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here um, in uh, Judiciary. I think this is our fifth stop um, to present the Democracy for the People Act. It defends and strengthens Minnesota's best tradition of inclusive, participation, sound election administration, and grassroots people-powered democracy. Uh, as the, the chair said, you know, we've heard and discussed the full bill in elections, and it's had a lot of stops already. It has a few more. Um, so I'll confine my remarks to the parts of the bill, the data provisions, the enforcement uh, uh, related to the prohibition on voter intimidation and deceptive practices, and the civil penalties related to the violation of foreign influence corporations. This is a package of common sense solutions that rests on the premise that our state works best when the voices of Minnesotans, not corporations, not special interests, are at the center of our democracy. When all Minnesotans, black, brown, indigenous, white, metro, greater Minnesota, rich, poor, Democrats, Republicans, and folks with no party at all, when they can participate freely and welcoming in our democracy. The relevant provisions of this bill um, protect the freedom to vote and respond to the rising uh, risk of threats, disinformation that we've seen over the last four years, the last few years. At the national level, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center have identified heightened threats targeting our elections. Um, in 2020, we had an experience um, where we saw a private firm, Atlas Aegis, reportedly recruiting armed uh, security contractors to come to Minnesota to be outside polling places. Uh, while the quick intervention of our Attorney General at the time and the Secretary of State was able to prevent that intimidating conduct, um, threats, intimidation, of voters and of elections of officials have been on the rise across the country. In 2022, there was concerning increase of intimidation in states across the country. In Arizona, we saw extremist groups recruiting uh, folks to monitor uh, drop boxes. In Colorado, we saw a group called uh, U.S. Election Integrity Project organizing volunteers to go door to door in search of voter fraud. We've seen non-governmental groups across the country and in Minnesota organize their own poll worker trainings uh, with instructions about what to do in the polling places that are out of step with, with Minnesota law. So we're grateful here in Minnesota that to our knowledge, voters have not yet faced that same level of threats and intimidation as we've seen in states like Arizona, Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia and other places. But unfortunately, the problem is only growing and emerging as we head into another uh, hotly contested election in 2024. This bill is an opportunity to draw a clear line of what's permissible and show that the conduct threats, interference, intimidation, deceptive practices is unacceptable. 
It provides clear lines and protections um, a few ways. It prohibits intimidating a voter with the uh, intimidating a voter with the intent to compel a person to register or to abstain from registering, to vote or not vote, and for specific vote for specific candidates or not to vote for that candidate. It prohibits intentionally deceptive practices intended to impede a voter from exercising their right to vote. And it prohibits intentional efforts to interfere with others um, who are helping to, to uh, help folks vote. It gives victims and law enforcement clear lines, civil and we discuss the criminal tools in public safety um, that they need to, to fight deceptive practices and acts of disinformation intended to interfere with the vote. This bill also, and the sort of other piece of this um, under this jurisdiction, closes a loophole in Minnesota law um, by extending the existing prohibition of uh, foreign nationals contributing in our elections to foreign influence corporations. As anybody who's knocked on a door in the past decade or two knows, Minnesotans are tired of the flood of big money in our elections. And they think that corporations, big corporations and the wealthy have too much influence already. This is a problem that voters want to fix, but unfortunately, the Supreme Court um, in Citizens United have taken away most of our tools in the toolbox to respond to the desire of the public to limit corporate spending in our politics. But the courts continue to allow uh, laws uh, that restrict contributions by foreign nationals in our elections. And Minnesota already has that law for individuals, but our law doesn't affect uh, for nationals who are operating in corporations. What this provision does is extend the existing prohibitions on foreign national contributing in our elections to foreign influence corporations. I think it's well thought of that Citizens United stands for the position that corporations are people, or I think the Supreme Court said, association of citizens. So it stands to reason that if foreign nationals can't uh, spend in our elections, they shouldn't be able to get around that just by doing it in corporations. Um, this bill applies the existing penalties in 211B uh, for violating these prohibitions. So those are the existing penalties if you are a foreign national uh, or, or, excuse me, a corporation spending um, in our elections. These penalties are already in statute. So I think uh, because I thought we were uh, short on time, I don't have any testifiers um, unless they're public testifiers, but uh, I'm happy to stand for questions. We can always become short on time. That's how, <laughs> that's how it works in this place. Um, we do have a couple of members of the public signed up to testify. I have Ray Parker. <coughs> Ms. Parker, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Hello. My name is Ray Parker from Rochester, Minnesota, and I have several concerns about the HF3 bill. Isn't the legal voting age still 18? Yet, this bill automatically registers 16 and 17 year olds to vote. There are approximately 80,000 16 to 17 year olds living in Minnesota that would now possibly vote fraudulently. We have seen the influence teachers have over their students, not only allowing, but assigning students to make signs for their candidates, driving during class time and with class resources. Extra credit and time away from classrooms to attend rallies, booing opponents or cheering on the teacher's candidate, and with phone in hand to tell them who to vote for and document it. No possibility of fraudulent coercion here, you think? So how about undocumented illegal immigrants. We have 81,000 to 95,000 in these undocumented people in Minnesota. Isn't it allow a law to be a citizen to vote? With no provisional license markings that for driving purposes only, this driver's license will lead to voter fraud, which is already rampant in Minnesota. Now we have the potential for 161,000 to 175,000 illegal fraudulent votes to happen. Couldn't that sway an election? Where is election integrity in this bill? What about crime? Minnesota's already chaotic mess with criminals running amok. Violent crimes going unaddressed like rape, carjacking, assaults, even murder going unpunished. Who can honestly say they believe that voter fraud would be punished? Ms. There's Parker, if we can stick to the bill, that would be great. There's no teeth to this bill for illegally voting, no repercussions for fraud, 
and without real consequences to acting illegally in this manner shows this bill HF3 to be a sham and designed for voter fraud. Vote no to HF3. Thank, you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up I have Elena Niehoff. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. <clears throat> Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Elena Niehoff. I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. I'm testifying in opposition to the bill HF03. We Minnesotans have the right to vote. Governments are instituted among the men to secure the rights of the people, including rights to have a safe election process. On the contrary, this bill fails to secure Minnesota election process. Example. Section 3, Subdivision 1, same-day registration and no provisional ballots. Click. Section 5, Subdivision 1B, pre-registration of 16 years old persons. 16 years old persons are not eligible to vote until they are 18 anyway. Section 6, Subdivision 1, permanent voter absentee list. No permanent voter absentee list should be exist. People's life circumstances change, and it is more problematic to remove the old data. Section 8, Subdivision 1A, automatic registration, and I'm going to quote, if the application includes documentation of verification of United States citizenship or records reflect that the applicant provided proof of citizenship during a previous agency transaction, and I'm going to quote, previous agency transaction, the proof of citizenship has to be provided at the time of the registration, not at the time of the previous agency transaction. This is the loophole. Section 8, subdivision 1B, this bill fails to require the applicant provide documentation providing their name and address by providing a piece of mail from utility company or other similar document. I request committee to write a new bill to secure Minnesota elections, which will provide provisional ballots, one day voting, paper ballots only, secure chain of custody for the ballots, and no voting machines. Please vote no for this bill, HF03. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to testify on this bill? <coughs> All right, uh, not seeing anyone. Uh, we'll move on to member discussion. Uh, Representative Frederick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, Representative Greenman, for bringing this bill forward. I want to address some of the comments that were just made um, <clears throat> in the bill. When it, uh, some of the commentary that we just talked about, 16 and 17 year olds, it is not uh, registration; it is pre-registration, and that's very two different things. Uh, we know that voter participation, when it comes to our young people, one of the biggest barriers for them to be able to partake in this process legally is being able to register and not knowing what to bring, not knowing how to register, uh, and so this. The system of pre-registration allows 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register, kind of put in a buffer, I think was the word that the Secretary of State's used. Uh, and when they turn 18, uh, or if they will be 18 for the next election, they get moved from that buffer into the actual voting rolls, so they are able to legally participate in our elections system. Uh, so I just want to be very, very clear that that pre-registration system is an effort to increase voter access access for young people. It does not matter what their political party is, if they, they could be voting Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever. Uh, it just helps our young people partake in democracy, which I would hope everyone uh, can support. Uh, Another piece that was brought up just now talking about driver's licenses, driver's license does not allow someone to vote. It allows them to drive. Uh, and I want to be very clear about that as well. Uh, and then I guess the only question that I would pitch to the author of the bill was talking about the permanent voter absentee list. If someone's looking to change, uh, and remove their name or add their name or update anything, uh, is that possible? 
Uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, Representative Frederick, you've heard this bill a few times, <laughs> and most of that stuff was actually not under the jurisdiction of this committee, but I appreciate that clarification for folks who have not heard that. Um, the short answer is yes, and if uh, we can get into a long conversation about the permanent MCT voter list, we currently have a, a list that you can sign up for. Voters think it's, it's a list to sign up to get your ballot, um, and we are changing it to conform to their expectations. Right now, they're just sent an absentee ballot application form every two years. Um, but yes, just like the way that you can update your registration, and you'll be able to update your registration through the DMV and other places in a much more efficient way, uh, you can do that with the absentee ballot uh, or the permanent absentee voter list. Uh, any follow up, Representative Frederick? All right. Uh, Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Representative Greenman, I wanted to um, focus on the uh, foreign uh, influence corporations provisions, and in particular, you discussed that, that this was about uh, uh, trying to stop uh, foreign nationals from operating through corporations uh, to influence our elections, and I could understand if we were defining foreign influence corporations to mean something that's uh, controlled by some foreign investor or a group of foreign investors, but it seems like the definition uh, sweeps much, much broader than that to cover uh, virtually every publicly traded American corporation. And so specifically, I wanted to uh, talk through the, the definition with you a little bit and understand um, where the thresholds come from. Uh, uh, Representative Niska, could you just uh, give us the line so folks can... Yeah, so um, the, the, the definition of foreign influence corporation is on page 22. It starts on line 8. Um, Thank you. And there's there are three um, uh, possible ways that a corporation is regarded as foreign influence. The first is if a single foreign investor holds 1% of the total equity... The second way is that two or more foreign investors, so all the foreign investors in aggregate hold 5% or more of the total equity. Um, and then the third one, I'm not sure what it means, and we can get to that later, but I, I, I just w would like, uh, if, the, if Representative Greenman, if you could explain a little bit where those thresholds come from, because to me, as someone who um, you know, does corporate law, um, helps corporations uh, structure themselves and, and try to look at who actually is in control of a corporation, those seem like extremely low thresholds when we're talking about who actually has decision-making authority in a corporation. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, um, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Niska. Um, and actually, it gives you an opportunity. I dig, dug really uh, deeply into this. Um, I think when Seattle uh, implemented this law, they were looking for the SEC. They were looking for other ways to say, what is the threshold where um, where corporate actors, where, excuse me, individual actors can and investors can exercise influence. The SEC's um, current 1% uh, uh, threshold to submit proposals to share shareholders for vote um, is, is, was one of the sort of lines, the standard thresholds. Um, they, the SEC has actually said that they think that actually might be a little too high, um, that they're actually under 1% under folks are exercising. Uh, Professor John Coates of, of Harvard Law um, uh, made a similar assessment, and I believe that the Business Roundtable, and I'll have to give you the citation of this, has said, you know, for the purposes of influencing um, the actions of a corporation, um, because when we're talking about uh, uh, corporations and investors, you know, we're talking, we're not talking about a legislature, we're talking about relatively disparate actors, 1% uh, in the hands of a single person or 5% in the hands uh, of a set of people um, is actually a threshold. I think that the Business Roundtable has said to in, in order to influence um, the, the uh, actions of that corporation. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Greenman. So um, if I'm understanding the analogy, then the, the uh, ability to suggest to a corporation an action, um, it, it, we're, it, we're sort of equating that with control. It seems like a, a stretched analogy. I mean, I think of myself, I, I, uh, constituents come into my office uh, regularly with suggestions about things to, um, to do. They, they, they certainly don't control me. The lobbyists who come into e each one of our offices don't, don't, don't control us. So I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand the, the, the imputation of uh, some sort of meaningful uh, control to someone who just owns 1% and can submit a Hey, uh, can you explain that a little bit better? Representative Greenman. Um, and I thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Niska. And that's why we're talking about influence, not just control, right? Um, and the question of, of corporate ownership, right, is 
a, a, a corporate law question for a different day, but when we talk about uh, the thresholds that have been identified by the business roundtable, by, um, and I don't know if I said the business roundtable, the partnership, but I meant roundtable nationally, um, uh, by the SEC to say that this is the threshold with which a, a, an investor is exercising influence. Citizens United said the, what their, their whole uh, premise for saying that corporations have speech, which some of us disagree with, but it is the law of the land, was that corporations are an association of citizens. And what we have, what we have heard, and if you, if you look to these corporate examples, is that about 1% of a corporation is about where that association of citizens, I think you could make the argument that a single investor, that's not what this bill does, to be clear, but I think you can make the argument if corporations are supposed to be an association of citizens, that a single foreign um, investor makes that, uh, applies that law of, pro, of prohibiting um, uh, foreign influence um, uh, or foreign contributions. I will say what we are trying to do here and the reason that the Supreme Court has upheld, um, I think in Blumen versus FEC, the ability of, uh, um, of, of, of us to prohibit foreign nationals um, and foreign actors from contributing in our elections is because fundamentally we're talking about the principle of self-governance. Self so for me, 1%, 5%, these are thresholds that, that are being used in, uh, um, with the FEC and other contexts. I think we really need to be careful and say, um, uh, uh, if we're talking about an association of citizens and that's a level that can influence corporate Operation, there is no reason that they should be spending money in our elections to influence American elections. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Greenman. I appreciate that um, explanation. A couple of, uh, uh, one comment and then another question. Um, because you referenced uh, Blumen versus FEC, I, I, I did think it was interesting that that case actually says that uh, they had no occasion to analyze the circumstances under which a corporation may be considered a foreign corporation for purposes of First Amendment analysis. And, and I, I think, frankly, this law is uh, going to test that and probably lose on, um, uh, on those grounds if it, if it is uh, passed and, and challenged. But I, you also made the comment that um, you could, someone could make the argument that one investor would lead to influence, and you said that the, that doesn't, that this bill doesn't do that, but I, I did want to come back to, to, to the third clause in the definition of foreign influence corporation, because I, I think it probably does. Um, that, that clause says, if a foreign investor participates directly or indirectly in the corporation's decision-making process with respect to the corporation's political activities in the United States, and every investor who receives uh, a proxy, uh, who holds a, uh, every shareholder who holds shares on the record date gets a proxy statement. They get to vote on uh, the directors of the corporation. The directors of the corporation then choose the, ex and then hire the executives of the corporation. Um, what does that mean and how does that, does, does that apply to every shareholder on a, on a record date who gets to vote on the board of directors of the corporation? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Niska. And I think what this third provision does is say when there's actually uh, direct or indirect participation, right, the 1% the and the 5% the are nature of just the, the amount that they hold. I think what the third provision says is when there's actually evidence of direct or indirect participation, um, there has been a movement in other places to give shareholders control of the political actions of corporations. That doesn't exist. So when we talk about shareholder, you know, shareholder proxy statements and whatever, the political decisions that are being made by corporations are not being vetted through, for, through shareholders as far as I know. I know that there's actually movement to do that, but that has not uh, become law. And so uh, I think when we're talking about this, we're talking about, you know, the management and the directors and where the decision, where the political decisions are made, that's not made at the shareholder level at this point. Uh, Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative Greenman. I appreciate if that's the intent. I think the words uh, participate and indirectly uh, sweeps much more broadly than um, maybe you're intending to go. But um, I did want to, uh, to ask then a little bit about the um, certification of compliance that's required um, in subdivision, uh, in section five of the, of the bill, subdivision 4B. So this is 23, uh, line 25. Um, is where that provision begins. And um, two questions uh, about this. The first is um, how many 
publicly traded, uh, Minnesota-based or United States-based publicly traded companies are going to be able to file this kind of certificate of compliance under the definition of the of foreign influence corporation that you're um, that you're proposing, and how many would be unable to do that, and therefore unable to participate in the political process as Citizens United uh, allows them to. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Representative Niska. Um, I think that what you're asking is actually um, uh, something that we would need to change the law and see uh, to find out if what you're asking is how many corporation, how many corporations that have foreign, um, that have a 1% or 5% uh, investor foreign threshold are currently acting in our elections and want to continue. Well, and I, c I probably can ask that question to the, about uh, uh, past action to the Campaign Finance Board. But how many will, will um, file for certification and have that declined? I don't know the answer to. What I will say is what we're talking about right now is corporations, right? The Exxon Mobiles of the world, the, uh, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of the corporations we've been talking about in the last couple of days, you know, the Sanford Healths of the world, whatever you say. We're talking about corporations that have met the threshold that have foreign influence investors acting in our elections, spending money in our elections. And to, to what you said, um, Citizens United very clearly says an association of citizens, but as you said, it doesn't speak about uh, 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 foreign corporations, but it does speak very, but but the law has spoken very loudly about foreign nationals. And we're talking about foreign nationals participating or foreign governments, um, as this definition says, uh, foreign governments, foreign political parties participating in corporations that are spending money in our politics. All right, Representative Niska, a final comment, and then we've yeah. got other members that on the list. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative Greenman. Uh, uh, a, a publicly traded corporation uh, can never say for certain on any date what one percent, uh, who might own one percent of its shares. Uh, uh, the SEC only requires proxy statements or, or, uh, or disclosures to be filed when someone owns five percent of a, uh, buys five percent of the equity of a company. Um, the certificate of compliance provision um, makes it impossible for any publicly traded company to ever uh, file the certificate of compliance under the statute. And, and so uh, it, it seems to me that this is, uh, and, and based on your comments, that this is uh, intended to prohibit any publicly traded company from exercising the, the First Amendment rights that Citizens United provides uh, for them the way it's drafted. Thank you. Uh, comment, Representative Freeman. Madam Chair um, and Representative Niska, I think if a company wants to act in our elections, they should be able to say what percentage of their uh, um, investors are foreign, because as we said, and if you go back to the uh, reason that the courts have upheld a prohibition on foreign influences, a foreign imprints, it comes back to self-governance. So again, if a corporation can't figure it out, um, to me, I think that the, the um, uh, um, the uh, balance should lie to voters who are actually asking for us to do this. Uh, Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn and Representative Greenman for your, for your bill. And um, I think that it's important to sort of just draw out a philosophical difference that we're hearing here, right, and how it, how it approaches the work that we're trying to do. Because we do hear often about um, a need to limit the ability of eligible voters to vote because of an existing fraud problem. Um, and, you know, to me, and as a person who reads, there's no vote, there is no voter fraud problem in Minnesota. I mean, we keep looking for fraud problems and we can't find them. We keep looking for this batch of voters who are voting that don't exist because they're not part of the factual record of our voting. Um, but we want to continue to limiting, limit the rights of people to vote while expanding the right of, of corporations to influence our elections, which we all can see, right? And now we're having a conversation about making sure corporations with foreign influ influence are protected. So it's very important to draw these, like we believe what we believe and we do the calculus that we do and what our elections are supposed to look like, but I just want to remind people about what this law is doing. Like, who is this law looking to protect in our ability to run safe and fair elections in the state of Minnesota? Thank you. Uh, Representative Greenman. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Finke, for uh, drawing us back to the, the two things that this does, which is it is about ensuring that Minnesotans who are eligible, el eligible to vote have access. Um, it's about ensuring, and the, the provision, the voter intimidation provisions, about our ensuring that we are uh, protecting them to, to exercise that sacred right, um, and we're protecting them from deceptive practices and, and other intimidating conduct. And it also is about protecting their ability uh, um, to influence elections when it comes to uh, the outcomes and when we see a flood of uh, um, of dark money, a flood of corporate money. Uh, another provision in this bill that we're not talking about today is just making sure that we know who is spending money in our politics. Um, that is something that both Minnesotans from both parties have said really loud and clearly they're concerned about. So I just, I really appreciate the, the clear line of what the end of the day what this bill is about is ensuring and really putting Minnesotans uh, back at the center of who uh, of, of self-governance. Uh, Representative Johnson. Chair Beckerfin. And actually, Representative Johnson, I just uh, get a note uh, from from other members. That if the audience cannot whisper and talk to each other, you can go out in the hallway if you need to talk. Um, members are having trouble listening to the actual debate that we're having, uh, discussion that we're having. So uh, go ahead, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker Finn, Representative Greenman, I just uh, wasn't planning to speak on this bill now, saving all that for the floor when it comes to the floor, but. Uh, one of the groups that would have to enforce some of the stuff in this bill uh, wanted wanted some clarification because they weren't sure on on it. Uh, Bridget, they they were wondering need, needed clarification if an election judge are considered election officials. <clears throat> Um, I'll, I'll allow this you to answer this question, but this has been heard in public safety and other committees and uh, is on its way to state government. Um, so we really want to focus on the civil penalties and the data portions, but I'll, I'll allow Representative Greenman to answer that um, question. The short answer is yes. All right. Uh, anything further, Representative Johnson? Uh, that, that was it. They needed clarification because of the civil penalties. They needed to make sure that the uh, election judges were considered on that in case something happens. Okay. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, a couple of questions. Um, but first, maybe a statement too. Um, to make the jump from foreign nationals to this kind of new made up definition of foreign influence corporations is a pretty big leap. Um, so I just, I wanted to get that on the record. And I, and I wondered too about, um, you know, one of the things with uh, legislation around here is it should achieve some sort of balance, right? Um, uh, and, and especially when we're talking about election law, and I just see sort of an imbalance and, and wondering why this bill doesn't, does, well, let me ask it in the form of a question, um, Representative Greenman and Madam Chair. Um, does this bill affect um, labor unions and nonprofits that might have foreign uh, influence? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Scott. And I, that was a, a conversation that we had in elections. Um, at at the, the current time, it doesn't. I think that one of the things we have, much, what, when Seattle was looking at this, there are much clearer rules, like the SEC has looked at, in terms of um, um, what investors, uh, um, uh, investor influence or corporations. I think if you're interested in looking at this, the question um, with both of the, the nonprofits that you uh, um, raised. Um, it's just a much less clear standard about how you would do that and draw that threshold. But um, I think as we talked about in elections, there's sort of some openness to thinking about that. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, understand you guys have the trifecta, right? You guys have the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. But, um, you know, some of your campaigns are largely um, financed through um, Alliance for Better Minnesota, um, and through um, entities like um, the Education Minnesota Union and other unions. So this is a very one-sided bill, in my opinion. It really is tipping the scale in one direction. Um, Madam Chair, I do have a question about, let's, let's 
get a real life example here. So let's say in Ely, we have a fly fishing company named Joe's Fly Fishing. And that company is owned by five individuals. They're all family members. And one of those family members resides in Canada. And so they make up more than 1% of, of um, the holdings of that company. So would then that company be excluded from making a political contribution? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Scott. And 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 let me clarify: um, uh, the non-corporate non corporations are on spending a lot of money right now on both sides of the aisle. This is not when we talk about the the, the both the what voters tell us, but also the problems we have. We have a bipartisan, and I would say sort of multi-partisan problem of, of corporations, of nonprofits, um, and of folks spending. So I, I, I disagree with your statement um, of uh, this being uh, um, uh, uh, one-sided. I think I could give you probably 10 examples of uh, C4s that are spending that are currently not required to report uh, that may uh, apply to this on both sides. So happy to, to share some of that, would love to do that with um, um, uh, some more information from the Campaign Finance Board. But uh, to your question about uh, a, a corporation, and you said resides, I assume you mean a citizen, because we're talking about foreign nationals, we're not talking about U.S. citizens who are living in Canada. Um, a U.S. citizen who lives in Canada can currently contribute, they can currently vote. A U.S., uh, uh, if you're talking about a Canadian citizen, um, then I think the answer would be yes. If, if, uh, if they make up, if that's 1%, of the of the um, of the limited liability corporation, then the answer would be yes. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And so, what about someone that has dual citizenship, or um, let's say that they're a green card holder here in the state of Minnesota? Um, does your bill address either one of those? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Scott. I think those are two separate questions. Um, and uh, on the, the green card holder issue, um, again, we're talking about uh, um, uh, foreign nationals, so presumably um, I would have to look at that, but I assume that they would be excluded um, or they would that that would that would be considered for an influence. On the dual citizenship, um, I would need to get back to you, but I, I am making the assumption that if you're a dual citizen, uh, you can contribute in American politics. If you can't, then that would follow that thing. But I, as a lawyer, probably shouldn't speculate, and I'm happy to get back to you on that, the, the dual citizenship question. Madam. Uh, Representative Scott has the floor, but I think Representative Feist maybe has a, some information about this. Well, I was going to say um, foreign or, um, green card holders right now can contribute under law. So I'm just wondering if, if this would make that law have under it. Under federal law. Under federal law. Yeah. Representative Feist, was that to this? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, so that is true, and it is a good question, just in terms of how this bill, how you want it to be structured, because green card holders can donate to political campaigns. Um, and, but on dual citizenship, I just wanted to say that the United States recognizes dual citizenship completely. Um, so, if you are a U.S. citizen and a citizen of any other country, you are still considered a U.S. citizen under U.S. law. So, thank you. Uh, further, Representative Scott. Yep. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to shift for a moment to the express advocacy portion of the bill. And, um, and Representative Scott, if you could point us to where in the bill, and hopefully this is yeah, relating on, to data or civil enforcement. Sure. sure. It's on, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, it's on page 21. Um, the definition is uh, 21.5 and following. And my concern is, um, Representative Greenman, do you think this portion of the bill will have a chilling effect on uh, people's First Amendment rights. On both sides of the aisle. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Scott. This is adopting the current federal standard for express advocacy, so my answer is uh, both no, and at the federal level, this is the current standard uh, for independent expenditure disclosure. disclosure. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so who will be who will be having the power to determine um, the thresholds for this? Is that the Campaign Finance Board or some other entity? Representative Greenman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Scott. I'm not sure what you mean about thresholds. What this bill does, what the Express Advocacy uh, does is close the loophole 
of the magic words, which is what they've done at the federal level. So it says it's a functional equivalent. It says if you're spending money um, that can be only interpreted by a reasonable person as containing advocacy of the election or defeat of one clearly identified candidate, that that has to be reported. So that is the campaign finance board. At the federal level, it's the FEC. Um, but what this does is basically say you cannot get around the standard just by not using four specific words. If a reasonable person would think, and, and when we heard this bill in elections, we actually had the campaign finance board uh, chair show a lot of really good examples that you probably couldn't tell the difference between uh, the one that said the magic words and the one that didn't. Um, and that's what this is intended to do is just uh, um, actually enforce a standard um, as, as the express advocacy standard in law. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, it seems like we're gonna be thrusting a bunch of subjective decisions onto the campaign finance board. Will people have to, would it be best if they, before they put out a literature piece, if they ran it by the campaign finance board first to see if they're gonna be penalized? Um, since we're no longer using specific words um, as the, the rule to judge this by, Representative Greenman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me just clarify, what we're talking about is disclosure and transparency. So this is just requiring those expenditures uh, to be disclosed to the Campaign Finance Board, like on the heart, on the candidate side, we do with every all of our expenditures. Um, and this says if you're an independent expenditure um, and you are going to spend for the, uh, that a reasonable person thinks that you're advocating for the election or defeat uh, because of a PCR bill, that you actually have to disclose that expenditure and the Minnesota voters uh, can know who's spending in their elections. Uh, the reality is when you look at these ads, um, and I think we've all seen them, um, it is pretty clear and people know the ads they're making. They're doing it for very specific purposes. They're just not using those four words so they don't have to disclose. Anything further, Representative yeah, Scott? Final, final comment. And um, I know Representative Greenman um, mentioned uh, Seattle and, and, and their adoption of this language or very similar to this language. And for those listening out there in the hinterlands, this comes directly from um, the Center for American Progress, who, by the way, takes a whole bunch of foreign money. And so I think this um, is a disingenuous bill um, meant to just uh, uh, penalize and restrict one side of the aisle um, in elections. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Greenman, for bringing this bill. I've, we've heard a, it's been a good discussion, but we've heard a lot of discussion about balance. I think the bill that you're bringing here, and, and, and I think you've been clear, the intent here is to provide some balance. Uh, we've had a history in this country when it comes to our democratic process and access to voting of who has access, the haves or the have nots. As a descendant of a group that was excluded from voting, whether explicitly in our law or impliedly by laws that were put in place as a poll tax to prevent access, I like any bills that will provide balance, that will allow the have-nots to have a voice mm -hmm. and to find ways to express that voice in our democracy. We've heard discussions about whether or not this applies to labor unions. Labor unions expressly exists because there is a pushback and a collaboration and solidarity against the haves, for the have-nots to have the opportunity to speak out and push back and have some say in what happens in the policy within this country and countries around the world. That is what they are made of, of the workers, who, by the way, outnumber the corporations and the entities that for far too long have had the type of influence over our policies in this country. So I applaud the bill. I thank you for bringing it. Um, I look forward to standing side by side with you if we push forward to get it into law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, closing comments, Representative Greenman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, for the discussion. Um, if I know I had an extra couple minutes, I would have brought um, some testifiers because we've heard a lot. Um, uh, and ultimately, this is about the Minnesotans um, across the state. This is about balance. This is about shifting the balance in our democracy back to the Minnesotans and voters um, who should have a say. So with that, um, uh, and who should, frankly, have the say about what we're doing here um, and, and what policies we're creating. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd ask for your support.
All right, uh, I will renew my motion to re-refer House File 3 as amended uh, to the State and Local Government Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion prevails and the bill is on its way to uh, State and Local Government. Uh, thank you members for a productive week. With that, we are adjourned.